So go ahead, I'll finish. Tell us about um, how you feel going into the surgery. Actually, I don't feel great about going to the surgery at all, to be honest with you. But it's something I need to do. And one of the things I'm learning from is that sometimes we may not always want to choose what's best for us. Mm -hmm. But because of so many people, I have, I have a great team of healthcare providers, a great uh, uh, case manager that gave me all of the uh, directions for us, what the surgery is going to be, what the recovery is going to be like. I'm truly blessed, to be honest with you. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not something that I'm expecting at all as to having so many issues, but those are issues. <laughs> and yeah. again, I'm grateful, yeah. uh, to be honest with you. I may not feel like I want to do it, but there's a lot of things in the military I didn't feel like I wanted to do either in my yeah. life. But you start picking the right things. So wait, oh, I'm not always going to feel great about certain things. But I had to look at it, is it healthier for me? And yeah. emotionally, spiritually, financially, is it healthy for me? Yeah. And trust and believe me, me and Nicole, as soon as we hear that you're good, we, we coming up there at some point. We have to see <laughs> Uncle Patrick, man. But one of the questions I Thank do you. have is, um, man, what led you? What, what, what led you um, to join the um, Air Force? What, what was going on in your life like? Why did you join the Air Force? Well, I came, I grew up in the 60s, early 60s. So okay. when everyone was dying, like the president, Malcolm, uh, Martin, I seen so much death in my life as a little kid. Growing up yeah. and seeing things uh, downtown Houston, we had a lot of things going here. Uh, so I was blessed as a kid, to be honest with you. I worked in department stores. Okay. I did first I did supplies and then I ended up working in uh, display. Okay. So I worked for a number of department stores. And I will admit that one of the biggest stores here in Houston is called Sackowitz. Uh, I was only 16 and I was working display in a department called Gourmet Foods and Wines. Now I'm right out of the hood. I'm gonna be honest with you, Phil Ford here in Houston <laughs> and have a clue. I was just good at display. I just love people. I love doing a display. Yes, sir. And then one time this, I think I know it's 16, that one time this gentleman came by and wanted to ask, he asked me, did I know anything what I was doing? If they like what I was doing at the age of 16. And I'm I'm really displaying big, big bottles of wine, oh, different wow. gourmet foods from all over the world that I knew nothing about. I know that had to be fun. But it was fun, and the, the fun thing about that was, as he asked me that question, I didn't know that he owned the store. Oh, he came wow. to me because one of his, someone that he knew, and people didn't so much like that. She was an older lady, and she always had these here, these, they were like fur that you would wear, the little uh, uh, fox, the little fox things that people see like on some of the old movies. Oh yeah, <laughs> people like talking to her. Uh, a tiger or something like that. Almost like the yes. one that's coming to America that laps around your chest. Yeah, so, <laughs> but I liked her, you know. And I was a little kid, and I did not know that Lee was a millionaire. And she oh. liked me, so she told him. He came to me and said, uh, "If he asked me the question, did you know anything about it?" I said, "No." And he took me to sit in the training at the age of sixteen to learn about gourmet foods and wines, different things about your cool. gourmet food. So I love that. And right from the, as I'm doing that, someone else walked up to me at the store and mentioned, well, if you ever get tired of doing this, I was turning, I was going on, I already, it was already at the high school. I just came out of high school. And so I'm going on 18 now. Uh, and someone approached me about getting a job at the bank, which was right next door. So I'm thinking, then we're talking about again, we're talking somewhere in this early 70s, 71, 72. And the gentleman came to me and something, okay, working at the bank, being a security guard, doesn't sound so bad. So I think that sounds good. So I went to the bank and because he, he said, I'm gonna walk you through some things. And he walked me down. In fact, it was at the bottom of the bank. He walked me through uh, where the coins were. He walked me to where the, the bills were, but then he, he walked me into another room and that was where you transfer the stocks and bonds between the bankers and the brokers. I knew nothing about it. So he gave me a job to transfer stocks and bonds. Oh, I had, wow. to, had to wear them on my, I had like a little briefcase. It would, it would be, I uh, had a little lock to go to my wrist. I'm only, I think at that point, am I still 17 or 18? Probably just turned 18, if I was 18. 
So I'm at the bottom part, I didn't know that you can transfer bonds. Uh, I didn't know that Houston had, you can go from bank, different banks underneath the city itself. Oh, wow. I didn't know the place existed. <laughs> Wow. And when I saw these bankers and these brokers, how they lived, how these men looked, not just the watches, how they had their fingers dead, uh, the carpeting in, in the places that I was able to go to. And when you're young and black, you hear about so much negativity with the issues with Vietnam, what's happening in the city. They gave me a whole different perspective of my life. In fact, working department stores gave me that effect, that, uh, that effect but what I really wanted to do was be a medic. I grew up with so much violence, so much death that I saw as a young kid. And then, the, then TV was always about Vietnam, people dying, yeah. especially when it was getting ready to close. And since we didn't know it was closing, but we seen so much death. So I wanted to be a medic. That was what I really thought I was called to do. Uh, actually, I wanted, at some point I was gonna be a medic, go to Vietnam, jump out of a helicopter, save everyone that was and when you're young that's what you're thinking of <laughs> but i i love astronomy and to this day i still love astronomy like to like what's out there in our universe but yeah. i grew up loving astronomy but okay. being a medic is what i wanted and when i joined the military we just close vietnam vietnam like as, as as afghanistan and certain other things we don't even know what the closing is going to be okay so no one knew that vietnam was going to close so quickly so they asked me, what did I want to do? Once I got in, they said, well, we don't need any more medics. So they said, well, where are you from? Which of course they knew that. Uh, I told them we have horses, we have cows, and we have oil. So they said, if you want to learn something about the oil business, we'll teach you. And they taught me a lot. Oh, wow. And I got to admit, I, I, I appreciate it. I never applied any of it. The training was great, the great training, the tra uh, the Things that we was able to do, uh, be deployed to go and do these different things, uh, little games that we would play. I enjoyed all of that. But really, I wanted to be just a medic. Okay, That's so, why I joined the military. So I guess one of my questions will be, so in the Air Force, um, when you went in, um, did y'all have um, specific job titles that you can sign up for? Because I know during my time, uh, one of the things they allowed you to do, they allowed you to pick your job. So like for me, I was a diesel mechanic who got reclassed to an MP, but when I went in, I knew joining, I would be an MP. So it wasn't one of those things that where I went through training and I, you know, would figure out later after training, um, basic training um, that I would be, you know, whatever MOS or job um, they would ask me to be. So how was that for you? Actually, that was one of the most difficult times for me. Uh, when I went in to be a medic and I saw so much death, I passed these tests for, uh, weapons. Okay. My job was to go to train, which I did. They sent me to Colorado for training. So you can either do it, uh, apply the uh, the missiles on the planes, or actually you can go to, there were certain places in Arizona you can go to, and where they launched the missiles from uh, underground. Okay. So <laughs> I declare myself a country's objector. <laughs> I, I saw so much death, so much violence. My job was when I joined the military, the and I chose Navy was my first choice. It's just that the Air Force took me quicker. But just because I had a skill set in electronics, that, that's not what I really wanted to do. And to this day, my skill set is right where it used to be. Although I had a major stroke, which uh, allows the ability to read and write and see someone on the right side, I love uh, technology. I absolutely love it. It's something gotcha. that's easy for me. But no, I declared myself a country's objective. And that's when they asked me, that I want to go out if I want to just get out to service or uh, could they apply something else for me. And okay. actually all business was not what I really wanted to do. I prefer just working in the hospital, but you can't, I learned something in the military too. You may not like something, but they make the decision for you. Got you. So when they made the decision for me that this is what you're going to do electronics and you declare yourself a country inches objector, it just opened up so many doors that you won't get caught up in. So your time is way different because I, I like I said, we got to pick our job. So just listening to you, y'all didn't get to pick your job. It was more of no. what they want wanted for you. Wow. That's exactly it. That's how Vietnam went too. Even if you got drafted for it or went to it, it was what they wanted from you. The wow. Army, Marines, Navy, Air Force, it's what they wanted, which your score sets were. 
you know what your what your scores were, but if they make the decision. They remember they told us something about uh, you had a wish. What they gave us uh, a wish. Yeah, I remember something. that the wish the wish list because like you got the, it was um, a wish. for us. You got to pick your duty stations, which for <laughs> me, um, my auntie worked at Brent, so it just so happened for my Christmas gift. She she assigned me to go to Korea, so. I was a little uh, small in that in, in, in that aspect. <laughs> Man, I love your story about that. I went to Fairbanks, Alaska, and stayed there forever. I you like know, Alaska. How was, how, was, how was Alaska? Because I mean, that's one of those places I heard a lot of different things about. I wish I got to go to Alaska. That was just cold. But when you're young, you still have a good time. You still go out and party. Nothing really changed a whole lot, to be honest with yeah. you. It was just fair. I think we got like there was no no wind no windshield. It was it was under 50 degrees below zero. And it was no wind. You take coffee, oh. you go you go on the inside to take the coffee, come out with a hot cup of coffee, toss it in the air, it would just vap evaporate. You know what's so funny about that? I, I seen that on T one time I was on YouTube and I seen the guy in Russia do that. He was on, um, he had some ball in water. He went and threw it outside the window and when it hit the air, it just turned into snow. I was like, wow. So you got to see Whoa. that. Two and a half years. They got to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I was being, I think I was being punished. <laughs> okay. For declaring myself a country's objector. But okay. I have no complaints. I learned a lot. I miss. Uh, the guys that I was with. Okay. That's what I missed the most. I still remember at, at the age of 65, I still remember those moments that we had together. Okay, so did you um did you have your um did you have your children around that time when you were in the military or the children went after? No, actually when I was in the Air Force, uh my I had two daughters, they were with me with their mom. Okay. okay. So it was on base. And back then, all thing I paid for, I think the light bill was six dollars but everything else was paid for electricity wow. everything was paid for wow. and it was nice it was two bed it was uh upstairs and downstairs and we also had you can go down in the, in the bottom part of it so it was all free okay okay so quite one question i would have another question i would have is um so how did um the military affect you as a father as an um husband did that have any bearing on your relationship outside of the military it had a great issue with me because although I was able to do a lot, being in the Air Force and, and what I was doing, I always had a second job. And then I okay. also volunteered. Uh, I did um, Cub Scouts. I did the Cub okay. Scout training. So I was always, I always had a second job, always busy, but it did affect me a lot because it was so much things. So it wasn't just the people fighting in Vietnam. Some people brought the fight back home here. Yeah. They were still fighting yeah. on the base. And I did not, I, I, it was something like I never thought. You know, yeah. bad enough when you're growing up so young and you're in the 60s, and we had a lot of violence in the 60s. And then in the military, uh, when Vietnam closed, the people coming home, it was still fighting. Wow. So all those things I did not expect. So it did have a it had a great effect upon me. But it took all these years, like I said, for uh, what well, I mentioned earlier, I had psychiatrists when they gave me the 100% that I need to work on myself. Okay. And not until I'm 65, I've been here for five years here in Houston, I started working on myself until I turned 60. Don't wait that long. Yes, sir. Work on yourself now. Wherever you are, trust me, uh, I believe it's a power greater than me. And you find the tools. And there's, you just gotta, you gotta really want it. Yeah. And I did not know what my psychiatrist asked me to do when he told me to find a life. I knew what, I had no clue what life was. I thought life was survival. That you yeah. just gotta go through everything. But then when, now in my life, man, I'm, I have a lot of joy. I'm grateful, getting ready to have the surgery, but I'm still grateful. Yeah. And I, I would say, oh, that's a blessing, man, just hearing from you. And I, I'm be honest with you as a younger, as a young man, I thank you just for the even the encouragement to, um, to say, you know, work at stuff now. I mean, just that little bit, I think that helps out a whole lot because I know um, when I ask you that question, I'm saying I'll ask you that question because just listening to your answers, we have a lot of similarities of how the um how things were before the military and how being in the military um affected your life and then how after the military 
um, things, you know, going your life, especially because of um, certain things like for me, um, always being at different duty stations, always being in isolation with the people that I serve with. At some point, it started, you know, taking its toll on me as a family man, because here it is growing up. I mean, I learned a lot of different things from my dad. But as a kid, I had a lot of, you know, hatred and anger towards my parents because, you know, I went through um, a situation as a kid where my parents divorced. And, you know, now looking back, man, listen, relationships have different things to happen. And, you know, the answers that I wanted back then, they don't owe me those answers for what happened. You know, yeah, it affected me. But at the same time, it didn't stop me from being who I am today. And it took me a long time to figure certain things out. And how to move, and, that, and the thing I had to figure out was how to move on from all that because for so long, I wanted answers. Why this? Why that? And those whys and those, you know, those whys and those questions I have, they transferred over to the military because now when, you know, I'm meeting people who are, you know, commanding officers and sergeants, you know, who trying to help me out because I had that, you know, hatred in my heart or the anger in my heart towards my father. Now it affected my career to where as a, a soldier, I didn't progress like I should have. Like I had intentions to stay in the army forever and become sergeant major, but it didn't turn out that way for me because of just me not letting certain things go and me carrying those baggages that I had in my life. Like I carried, I carried it throughout my whole life for a long time, and it affected everything. And it, and it even affected me to the point to where when I got out of the military and I lost the military, like how you say, get you a life, or oh, I didn't have a life after the military because for me. I thought the military was my life. Um, and a lot of the reasons why I felt like that was my life, because before the military, what ended up leading to me joining was I ended up getting a drug charge, you know, because at this at one, some point in my life, I, I thought I was going to be the drug dealer. Like, oh, man, I'm going to sell drugs and I'm going to live in the streets and do all this stuff. Now, mind you, I grew up in a home with Christian parents that didn't do this type of stuff, but for me, you know, my influence was my friends and the guys I hung around. Hey, I thought I was going to be one of the fellas and I was going to do what they were going to do. And so I start trying to sell drugs, but I didn't go to jail for selling drugs. I went to jail because I had drugs on me, which led to me at some point joining the military. And I would say that was one of the best things, but still yet, because I had a lot of bags that I was carrying, it affected my career to the point to where I didn't end up finishing, you know, my career like I should have. And at the same time, it ended up almost destroying my marriage and everything else after the military. Like going in the military, I accomplished a lot. Getting out of the military, I lost a lot. And a lot of that stuff had to do with just at some point. And I think that point was for me um, in Afghanistan. At some point, I remember we went through like this bad convoy to where I almost lost my life. And I became mad at God for some years because I felt like, man, how could I believe in God and he allowed me to go through all these things? And I started blaming God for my childhood. I started blaming him for just everything, even the mistakes that I made. I blamed him for like everything. And I just didn't want to deal with nothing. I was just mad, angry at the world. You know, if there is a God, why would he allow me to go through all this stuff as a child? Then I go in the military. And, and when I went into the military, even though, yeah, I sold drugs before, I got my life together. I was living for the Lord for a while. But then it became hard to be a Christian in the military because most people in the military are atheists. They don't believe. They believe in different, you know, all religions or whatever the case may be. And I had no problem with that. But at some point, you know, certain things they, they did, because I already had issues going on, it affected me to the point to where I started becoming angry at certain situations. And one day I just lost it. And it just like mentally, I just checked out. And instead of me having belief and trust and, you know, this love for family, I just like, this is myself, isolated myself and, you know, drugs and alcohol and partying and everything else became my new, you know, found life. And for a long time, that was a part of my life. And you transition that into being a father and a, and a, hu a husband and a father now, that stuff still affected me because instead of me being focusing on the mission, which was family, I was focusing on me and what I wanted. Like, I, I'm old this and everybody owed me and everybody owed me and I deserve this and I deserve that. And then you get out the military and then here it is, the same mindset. 
the, the VA owe me and this person owe me and everybody else. And I'm just pointing the fingers, pointing the fingers, pointing the fingers. And one day it was just like the Lord allowed me to see myself in my son's eye because I remember one day I looked at him and I saw that same hurt that I carried as a kid. I saw in his eye and I realized that I became the very father that I was mad at. I became that guy. And that was like one of the things that kind of just like shook me because here it is my whole life. I spent pointing the fingers at everybody else, making everybody else responsible for my life, not realizing that I need to take responsible for my, responsibility for my own life and be responsible for my own actions. And it wasn't until I got to that point that I start really finding a life. And that life consists of me stop pointing the fingers at people, blaming this, that, and the third as the reason why. I am who I am and I became what I became at that time. And I thank the Lord for that because, you know, my life is so much greater now that I'm learning to take responsibility. And, you know, my relationship, my dad is like the best in the world. I thank God for him. Now I'm able to look back and see that, man, you know what? I had a dad. I was able to grow up around a strong man. But what I didn't realize was he went through a lot, too, because he was in the Marines. He went back in the 80s. So it's just a whole lot of different stuff that I would never understand that he dealt with. So, I mean, you know, now I see how sometimes things can, you know, play with it. Like that, that's, it had a song back in the days that he used to say, your, your mind playing tricks on you? Well, my mind, <laughs> your mind start really playing tricks on you, having you thinking there's a lot of things. And a lot of time it's just you. You need to find a life. You need to get yourself together. So it's good here. You know how you got yourself together. Well, I like where you are too, because that's one of the things that we learn. Uh, well, I learned a, a, quite a few things. One is what part did I play in a lot of things in my life? Yes. Not so much what happened to me or why, what part did I play? And some things I didn't play, sometimes you're just born, you just, you just caught a bit into something. Yeah. It's like being in the military, what if you're just going right into combat and you don't, you don't really plan that. You don't know if someone's going to come out the corners and in your life and, and or, or be bombed or shelled. You don't see that coming. Yes, so right. a lot of things, we just get caught up in things. But what part did we play? We either was there for whatever reason, but you work on that, the, the why part. Yes, I work right. on my why in my life. Yeah. I am very, very grateful. At my yeah. age of 65, be 66 in a couple of months. Look at your why. Look at what you want now. That's okay, right. you, we can look back, take that, take that, just that look sometime where you've been, but look at where you are and where you want to go yeah. to. I can't change where I've been, yeah, but I can definitely change each day my feelings, how I feel right now, and still stay motivated enough to want something else for the next day. Yes, sir. And I think that's what the whole vet talk is about. That's what I want this platform to be about. I want it to be one of those platforms where veterans can hear our story, anybody else's story, and they real and they come to that realization, like, bro, the fight never stopped. You just got to get back in the fight. Like, you have to get yes. back in the fight. And the fight I'm talking about is not combat. It's not war. It's fighting for yourself and those who, you know, who love you. You know what I'm saying? Your family, like, you got to get back in the fight for them. You can't check out. You can't let drugs and, you know, alcohol and all these other things that, you know what I'm saying, you're doing to try to cope with and deal with what you've been through. You just got to, you got to deal with it. Because I know for a long time for me, I, I try to self-medicate myself. But one thing that I came to the understanding of is once I got sober, all those same problems came right back around. So how I was spending all that time trying to drown away stuff, it never allowed me to deal with it. Now that I've been sober and I've been able to deal with it, it feels so much more better because now in dealing with it, I can move past it. But I'm learning in life until you deal with things, you're not going to be able to move past things. That's very true. And that's, well, they taught us that in basic training, how to deal with things. Yeah. Sometimes we look at all the negative, the negative things in our life, but look at some of the positive things in our life. Basic training meant a lot to me. Yes, I sir. mean, the the training they gave us, and no matter what, it could be hot, rainy, cold. You went march yeah. in the Air Force. I don't care. They didn't, yeah. they didn't care about none of the about how the weather was. You were gonna march. When you when you finish marching, you come. You're gonna do your shoes. You're gonna wax everything in the place. You gotta do the floors. That was life. That's life. Yeah, Those yeah. are skills that some of us 
we didn't think about that. I didn't think about that until I started what it's called recovery. When I started working on me, it's called recovery. My life started to change. Picked up those old tools when I got, when I was only like 18. Oh, applied wow. the tools I learned. And you keep yeah. going. Yeah. Man, I'm I, proud of you where you are. And I think, I think that's, I mean, I'm proud of you too. I mean, because I always say, man, to be 65, I to be 66, and you still growing and still learning. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest to you, oh, you somebody to admire, and I wanna be like that at your age. I wanna be able to be that younger gentleman that's always open to learning. Because I believe the day that you stop learning, that's the day you start dying. Because now, I mean, you're not growing. I mean, and we yeah, have to you, continue to grow. We are yeah, working you, showed me the, you know what? You showed me the world. Not to cut you off, you have shown no, me the fine. world because all I saw was Fairbanks, Alaska. Colorado, of course, different places, but you show me the world. And sometimes when we think things are just that bad, you saw it worse being in other countries. Yeah. But we yeah. think, well, we think, well, you know, we see people under the freeway here or catching a bus. Man, those people don't have a bus. Yeah. I didn't see that world until you until you showed me that world by just listening to you. I didn't know that world existed, to be honest with you. I only saw it on some PBS maybe, but you really don't see it. They only show you what they want to show you. But what you described was something totally different. And that's the same way it was for me growing up in small Georgetown, Paul is out of Plantersville, South Carolina. It's so small to where um, you don't see a lot of the things in this world that's really going on. But it's a blessing. And I always say it's a blessing that I, I was able to see those things. And I mean, I look at it like this right here, being that I was able to leave I was able to meet your niece, and now I got this cool uncle, man. And that's, I mean, that, and that means a lot to me, man. I mean, that, that means a lot to me because, I mean, I don't know where I would have been had I not had my wife. I mean, and that's one of the people I thank the Lord for because it's like I needed her. I really did. And I always tell her she's my battle buddy because, of course, we served together. We were downrange together. Our situation is unique because it's one of those situations in our minds at the time, it wasn't supposed to be because all it was supposed to be was a deployment friendship <laughs> that turned into, you know, her getting pregnant and us getting married at some point. And I mean, one thing I can say out of all that stuff is it taught me a lot about growth and how things can change and how things can get better. And I would say, you know, being in my relationship with her has taught me how to love again. I mean, especially because now, you know, because we share kids together and my son, like he became that second chance at life, not for me to live through him, but to realize like, bro, you got to let that stuff go because you have meaning beside you. Like he has purpose and you got to invest into that. You got to help him be that man that you couldn't be. And in order for me to do that, I have to forget about what I've done and I have to invest every ounce of time every ounce of whatever I have into him so that he can, you know, be a better man. Cause that's my goal for all of my kids is that you got, you got to be better than me. And I'm not afraid for them to be better than me because that's what life is about. Because that's the same way it was with me being in the military. People trained me because they expected me to fill their shoes and, you know, to be better at what they did. So and I had a lot of great leaders that, you know, taught me that stuff. And it's the same way now. Um, at my church, I got a great leader who's teaching me the, the same thing. So it's just like, man, I've been fortunate and blessed. Even my dad, like now that I'm able to, you know, get some of those things out of my mind and I, I'm able to talk to him, like, man, I, I realized, like, man, I have the greatest dad in the world and I wouldn't change nothing about him. Anything, I would have had his back more back then. That would be the one thing that I would change. But, you know, I always let him know now, like, dad, I got you back. Because, again, I realized I wouldn't be here if it had not been for him and my mom, you know. So I thank God for that situation, too, because that's what, you know, pushed me and compelled me to be in the man that I'm trying to be every day. And I hope I to like inspire that. other veterans to do that same thing, too. To keep pushing, man. Keep keep going. Don't, don't let your past stop because it has no bearing on your life unless you allow it to. Now, I learned that because although... I thought I had everything, the convertible, the townhouse being completed, had a great mentor, but I tried to commit suicide. I gave up, you know, I, I, I think that was before my stroke or after my stroke, and I just oh, wow. gave up. And 
I didn't, I didn't know that I had so much. In fact, if, if, when I was in mental health, a guy changed my life. We were all locked up in mental health at the VA. You can't get out. But this guy went through this series. There was a quote from uh, something about called change. When he said that, that quote is stuck with me. It's sticking with me for the rest of my life now. Change. Every day, there's going to be some type of change. What we're going through right now, this pandemic, relationships, finances, that's called change. Yeah. Either you're going to uh, go with that change or get stuck yeah. someplace. And I, and when that guy did, when he said that in, in mental health, I'm thinking, okay, now, I mean, all my rights been taken away. Now I'm considered that I can't make decisions in my life. When I heard that word change, it changed every aspect of my life. Forgiveness of yourself, forgiving others. Look at the, our military experience. I had a great time in the military. Oh yeah. Maybe just gonna, gonna complain. Or it was, okay, that's that's called life. Yes, Gas sir. prices went up, you know, food <laughs> went up. That's called life. Yeah. But apply what I learned in basic training. Yeah. You get up. They taught us the skill set. Yeah. If, I were, if it wasn't military, our grandparents, I had a great grandmother. Yeah. She she gave it to me. I just wasn't listening. Yeah. It took that three heart attacks cancer, a stroke, now heart, open heart surgery coming up. But man, I'm grateful. That's called change. Yeah. I got to go with that flow. Get up. Better late than never, man. Better late than never, man. Better late than never. And I think that's a blessing, man, that you taking advantage of the opportunity. And I think that's one of the things that I hope that we can give a lot of veterans is that hope that, man, you know what? It's never too late to start. It's never. Like, don't let your current situation or circumstances tell you, hey, this is it. You know what I'm saying? You don't have no hope. As long as you have breath in your lungs, there's always hope. And I pray that, you know, most people there find that hope. And the only way I know personally I was able to find that hope was in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Like I had to yes. have him. Now, other people may not believe. And again, it's not a platform to turn people into believers because Again, people may not believe, but if they want to know my true answer and my true key to add, my the, the key to how I became what I am now, it was him. I, I couldn't do it without him. It took him putting some stuff on some DVDs of a pastor that now became a pastor to kind of spark some things in my brain. Because at some point, my brain had turned off. And I was living in isolation in my own head, thinking that everything, like my teacher used to say, the world revolved around me and it was always me and it's all about me and what had happened to me and I need somebody to be responsible for what happened to me and <laughs> listen to that guy on that DVD and all of a sudden he started fussing because that's how I took it. It wasn't like he was fussing, but the way he was preaching, it was just like, oh my God, brother, I'm horrible, I'm trash. I was the first time somebody in life, and it was like I said, it wasn't him personally telling me that, but the message stuck out to where it made me be responsible for everything because for so long, again, I was trying to shift responsibility. I was trying to say it was everything else. I wouldn't take responsibility for what I had done. I was always saying, well, I wouldn't have did this if it had not been for that. And I'm realizing and learning that as a man, nah, bro, you're responsible. You're responsible for your own actions. I remember I was in, um, in a psychology class and my teacher he or uh, not my teacher my teacher's son he had on these ugly socks and he showed us the socks and we were looking at the socks and we were talking about how the socks look we were describing how the socks look and he asked us a question he said so based upon you know most of y'all response um because the simple fact some of y'all said my socks are ugly or whatever the case may be if I go and bust out this glass over here, should you have to pay for that glass? And everybody like, why would I pay for the glass? He was like, well, you said all those things to me, da da da. They were like, yeah, but you know, I, I'm not, um, I'm not gonna pay for that glass because you broke that glass. And in that moment, that's what he was trying to teach us was, bro. Yeah, people may say things to you, people may do things to you. Yes, but they're not responsible for your response. You are. You have to take responsibility for your response and how you react to what people do. And that's the one thing that at 37, I wish I knew at 21. But, hey, life happened. It happened. I did it. Okay. <laughs> I got the T-shirt. 
<laughs> I, I, lo I love that perspective of yours. And I like how you feel about people because, you know, we go through so much and we hear so much, especially in, in the media right now, how you're different about people. I'm going to tell you something. I remember all those moments when I was in the military with some great people. Yes. Different branches sometimes, how we felt as kids, how it be <laughs> maybe 120 degrees in certain, certain locations outside and all these aircraft taking off around you. But some guy you see from a little distance, he got maybe about so many seconds to, but he's singing and they're jets taking off everywhere around us. Man, I remember those days playing chess. Listen, we we're all young. We was on like 17, 18 back in the day. I think about all the good things in my life. Come into Houston because of the VA hospital, teach me about recovery. Man, I look at all the good things and I'm grateful. God bless yeah. me yeah. to come here. You know, people would say, well, how bad was it in the military? Well, how good is it now? Yeah. Life is gonna still be life. Yeah. I love yeah. how you got your perspective on people, on yeah. different different races, nationalities, and you don't, you're not judging people. Like a lot of people complaining, it's always somebody else. It's just life. Yeah, and, um, and, I, and I say that because in order for me to get saved, and again, I'm not trying to make this that platform, but I had to forgive because the Bible says in order to be forgiven, you have to forgive. So I had to forgive. And I was expecting God to forgive me because this is like, at that moment when I got saved, I was able to look at all the things I'd done. Like I thought about all the women I've hurt. Think about how I was hurting the woman I was with. I thought about how as a child, I did a lot of different things in my life and how I hurt a lot of people. And when I finally was able to have that come to Jesus moment, as some people call it, I was able to see all the things I had done. And I realized that I was horrible. I realized that I was trash, like, and I needed to be forgiven. I needed because I had done just that much in life. As much as I was pointing my fingers and saying life had did all these different things to me, I had done much more as a response to what I felt like, you know, caused my hurt. But I realized their actions didn't deserve the reaction that the rest of the world, like I made my, I made other people in life pay for something that somebody else did. But then even with that, I had to learn that, hey, people hurt people hurt people. So they weren't hurting me because they wanted to. Some things might have happened out of what they were dealing with. Like it was just a lot of different factors and things that, you know, my little mind couldn't comprehend and understand at the time because here it is, I'm young, so I couldn't see, you know, the, the, the bigger picture was, man, it's just a pattern. It's a pattern in life where we all doing the same things. But, you know, I'm over it now. We moved past it and we're moving on and we got a minute left. So, you know what? <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for, you know, just this opportunity to sit down and talk yes. to you, man. Man, I love this. Thank you for this platform as well. I love this. Thank you for being family and also a veteran. I don't have very, very many family. I think it's only three of us. I know. <laughs> you, I know my family, but I have only a lot three of us. Vets, man. I got uncles, my father. It's a lot of us in my family because the South Carolina is, is only two things you do. There's a couple of things you do and military is one of them. So, okay. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I so, love this. Thank you for having this um, sit down with me, on, and we're going to talk and chat again, man. Okay. Love you much, bro. Love Take you too, Love you too, man.